Hi, welcome to uh, episode 9 of the Fight for the Future live stream. Uh, today I am joined by Fight for the Future's Deputy Director uh, Evan Greer and um, Joey DeFrancesco, uh, who is from the United uh, Union of Musicians and Allied Workers. Um, today we are going to be discussing um, some issues with Spotify and some new features that they've announced, some new patents that they've announced, um, and just some ways that they are you know, analyzing user data in a way that really seems to be violating the privacy of their users. Um, as always, I, I just want to remind folks, if you like content like this and you want to see more of these episodes, please make sure that you subscribe to the channel, that you like the video, and that you click the bell uh, so that you receive notifications in the future when we go live. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kick it to Evan, um, who can start us off. Cool. Yeah. Thanks so much, Joe. And thanks, Joey, for joining us. So I, I wanted to launch right in with just, you know, you've obviously been a, kind of a, a founding member of UMA, the Union of Musicians and Allied Workers. And there's obviously been a lot of activity on the existing Justice at Spotify campaign, um, you know, with kind of the demands that you all have been elevating around pay and transparency uh, and just sort of the company's <laughs> exploitative parasitic business model generally. Um, so could you kind of like start there and just like introduce, you know, folks who maybe know Fight for the Future, but haven't heard of UMA yet, um, just sort of what the union is, why you all formed it, um, why perhaps you formed a new musicians union, um, you know, instead of, you know, sort of organizing through existing structures. Um, and then, you know, what's been going on with Justice at Spotify? That's a lot of questions, but you want to just yeah. intro us there and then we'll, we'll follow up. I'll get as much as I can. Remind me if I if I forget one. But yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, very happy to to be here with you all and fight for the future and everyone who's 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 listening or watching. Um, yeah. So um, the the Union of Musicians and Island Workers started last year um, around this time, really kind of beginning of the pandemic. Um, as musicians, like a number of workers, were just totally. Uh, out in the cold suddenly, economically, right? Musicians make all of our money from uh, touring and performing live, um, which is a problem um, with Spotify and other streaming services. But that's where we make all our money, and suddenly we didn't have any. Um, so musicians who had for a long time kind of been talking about forming an organization to fight for our uh, collective rights as artists um, finally got together and were like, okay, now is the time to make it happen. It's finally like we, we, we were all out in the cold and we, we, we have time now because we're all off of tour. So we need to um, do this thing. So, so we launched around last year. Um, and the purpose of our organization was not to, you know, challenge existing musician unions. So there are some existing musician unions like the American Federation of, of Musicians, um, SAG-AFRA um, has a number of musicians, some other groups. Um, but those unions mostly focus on kind of musicians who are, are in a unique position where they have one employer, like if you're a musician who works for a symphony orchestra or a Broadway show or for a movie studio or something. Um, so we're very much, you know, in solidarity and support those musician unions. But there's there's never been a thing for like people like me um, and, you know, musicians like Evan and other other uh, musicians who I think are probably the wide majority of musicians now. You know, we have a lot of different employers. We have, you know, maybe multiple record labels. We play at 200 venues a year. We are getting money, a little bit of money from like 20 different types of streaming services. So there's never been an organization to fight kind of for the interests of this kind of like independent musician. Uh, so that's why we, we founded this is because, you know, musicians have for so long been complaining about the music industry online or just to each other at shows. Um, but we finally realized, you know, it's time to, to like not just complain, not just limit our political possibilities to like yelling at each other about being sellouts, um, but to actually build collective power to like take on um, those with capital in the music industry, like Spotify, like the big record companies um, and like so many other, um, you know, sources of inequality in this industry. Um, so we've launched a number of campaigns so far. Um, you know, asking for COVID relief for musicians, um, trying to come up with policies for, you know, safer venues when they reopen, a bunch of different things. Um, but one of our key public campaigns has been Justice at Spotify. Um, so after working toward this for a while of how we were going to do this thing, we launched it last October. And musicians have been pissed about Spotify forever, really since it launched, right? They pay almost nothing. 
Um, they displace so many other sources of income for musicians in um, the industry. Um, we know that streaming has only served um, through these types of services, it only served to um, push resources in the music industry to an, an ever smaller number of hands. We know, as we're going to talk about more later, that they're doing all sorts of um, terrible, scary data collection processes to, um, you know, to make money, to spy on their users, to sell data, to, you know, pump these kinds of algorithms towards a certain small number of major label artists, all sorts of stuff, some of which we don't even know about because it's so secretive and under such uh, closed doors. Um, so people have been upset with this company for a while. We decided it's finally time to, you know, act collectively to make some demands of this company, you know, like you do as a union, like you do as workers, like you do in any industry. So in October, we launched this, we're asking for a penny per stream. You know, a lot of people get bogged down in kind of the, the intricacies of how the streaming payments work, but we're kind of like, we know you have the money. We know you pay, you know, a third of a penny per stream right now. And it's, it's not a, a, a reasonable wage, especially for a company like Spotify that's, you know, worth nearly $70 billion in valuation right now, but is paying artists nothing. They've tripled in value over the pandemic, big pandemic profit here. Um, we're asking them to do things around payment miles, like adopt a user-centric payment mile to pay artists directly based on who's listening to them. We're asking for transparency, so their closed-door contracts are public, and so they disclose where their money's coming from and what they're doing with our data, which we're going to talk about more soon. We're asking them to end payola, right, so they can't just take money from record companies and, you know, promote certain artists um, in their algorithms. We want them to credit labor and we want them to stop fighting artists in legal battles. So we've already got over 30,000 artists signed into the campaign. On March 15th, we had a day of action um, around the world. So the first time this has ever happened with music workers. We had in-person, socially distanced collective actions um, all the way from Australia to Europe to Sao Paulo to all over the US and Canada demanding that Spotify meet these demands. Um, and now this week, we're, we're happy to also join with um, Fight for the Future um, and other organizations to, to demand that Spotify um, stop doing this creepy surveillance stuff, um, which I'm sure Evan can talk about more now. Cool. Yeah, that's a great um, overview, Joey, and obviously like a lot of stuff there. Um, you know, and Joe, feel free to, to jump in. Um, I mean, I feel like what's really interesting um, about the way that you all have gone after Spotify is like, it's really pointing out the fact that I feel like there's this narrative that's been there, you know, for even that I remember as a musician, like from back when I like first had to sign up with BMI and started getting like, you know, mail from them. And it's like this idea that like the internet is bad for music. And I just think it's so important when we talk about like Spotify, it's like, no, it's not necessarily the internet. It's that like a small handful of companies have chosen a business model that is like inherently exploitative and like will never succeed in like fairly compensating artists for their labor. Right. Um, and it's like, and, and those companies have like that business model has also granted those companies kind of, um, this dominance and monopoly power. And so we're now in a situation where like Spotify has so much power and so much influence. Um, and it's like, you know, and like the solutions are sort of right there or like there's like so many ways we could do this um, in a better way. And like, there, you know, there are some alternatives that like gain steam, like Bandcamp, et cetera. But it's like, I think it's so, um, I don't know. It, it's interesting to me just like that dynamic of like, you know, like artists coming together and being like, no, like you can just pay us more. <laughs> and like, you know, and we and fighting for alternatives too. So I, th I think that's cool. Yeah, like you said, it's about it's about power. It's not about the technology, you know. The and internet can be dis dispersed and controlled in so many different ways, uh, but we see in music is just a, a replication or intensification of the, the the unequal power dynamics that existed pre-internet, where you've got a few major labels now, you know, bolstered by a, a few giant tech monopolies um, who are just you know, in, intensifying the inequalities that existed before the internet. And no matter what new technology we have, that's going to be the case unless musicians build a counter power. And, you know, that's what we're trying to do. Cool. So Evan, um, why don't you, you know, expand a little bit on, you know, what, what Spotify is doing exactly. And, you know, maybe, 
you know, if it if it if it differs in any way from, um, you know, other like other like devices uh, and services that that you know use your data or listen to your voice or anything like that. Yeah, for sure. So I mean, just to kind of give folks an overview. So like Joey mentioned um, at the end there, you know, we launched a campaign, um, I guess, yesterday, um, along with a video um, that is specifically calling for Spotify to uh, commit to not implementing a patent that they filed to use to basically listen to your conversations, um, and then use artificial intelligence voice recognition analysis to analyze um, things that you say um, for for things like inferring gender, allegedly, uh, which you know I might have a thing or two to say about, um, for things like uh, analyzing your accent or your emotional state, and then using that to recommend music and advertising. So your question is right, Joe, in the sense that this is not, it's not unprecedented in the sense that it is very much in line with um, the kind of broader surveillance capitalist business and invasive business practices that we're sort of seeing take hold across the entire tech industry um, with things like Amazon's Alexa or Amazon Ring devices or um, just the increasing prevalence of always on, always listening, always watching cameras and microphones that are increasingly in devices that we wear in our homes, in our cars, et cetera. But what I think makes this particularly concerning and sort of a, a bit of a, a precipice or the tip of the spear is that Spotify is not just going to be listening. Again, they're going to be using AI to kind of analyze what they're hearing. So you can imagine a scenario where you tell a friend privately that you're feeling depressed and Spotify hears that and Spotify, you know, kind of analyzes that data. They throw, you know, it checks a certain box in thing that they're looking for that then tells their algorithm to play certain songs. And these algorithms are often black boxed, right? So they might not even know. It might not be so like specifically nefarious that they're like, oh, you're depressed. Let's play more Elliot Smith for them and like keep them depressed. But it's like the algorithm could actually end up doing that and sort of reinforcing your emotions by constantly shoving music down your throat that like the algorithm thinks you want to hear based on this AI. And we know that this type of voice recognition, emotion recognition, um, exhibits systemic biases. Um, we know that these data sets are often, uh, you know, have serious, uh, you know, kind of flaws when, um, you know, thinking, uh, when, you know, listening to or analyzing emotions or voices from people who are not white cis men. Um, but again, it's like, even if it does work perfectly, it's really dystopian. Um, and, and I think what it's like, there's something very specifically horrifying about it to me because it's music. And when I just think, you know, music is inherently emotional and we have an emotional connection to it. And so the idea of like normalizing this type of surveillance in a technology that's kind of like giving people something that they want and need, um, and the ways that that algorithm could then end up distorting not just the music we hear, but also the music we make, right? Like we already know there's sort of this like subgenre of like Spotify core where like because of the algorithm, bands start to get kind of incentivized to like make more songs like the one that did really well. Um, and like I don't fault <laughs> artists for that. Like, look, we like people have to do what they have to do. But it's more just when you think about the influence that this business model of algorithmic manipulation, basically like the Facebookization of the music industry um, and thinking about how that could distort the future of music, the way that Facebook is distorting kind of public opinion and, you know, undermining democracy. I just think that's like really freaky. And then especially when you just think it like, you know, humans have been making music for like literally thousands of years and we've been making music like for each other and to like provoke an emotional reaction for each other. And the idea that like music of the future will be made to please some like cold blooded algorithm, um, I just think is like has implications so far beyond just like the music industry, but like speaks to this kind of turning point that we're at where we have to decide whether technology is largely going to be a force for empowerment and upliftment or largely a force for exploitation and oppression. And, you know, the the things that we fight for and the policies that we put into place over the next couple of years feel like they'll have a profound um, 
you know, uh, impact on what the, the future of human civilization looks like, not to be too dramatic about it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's really freaky. Like the idea that not only will like the spectrum of music that people get exposed to sort of get narrowed down, but like the, the, the broader like aesthetic of music will get funneled into this like very specific box that the algorithm will be will be seeking like that. That is super dystopian. And it just sort of it does kind of take away from like the pleasure of just like browsing like catalogs of music, be it in a record store or even in a digital storefront, like say Bandcamp or or even iTunes, where you're not getting necessarily getting as much like algorithmic amplification of of the results. Um, could you maybe expand a little bit about like the specifics of of the patent that Spotify uh, filed and 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 how that technology works and what and more specifically like what they plan to do with it. Yeah, sure. I can quickly, and then maybe we can kick something back to Joey before, uh, if you have to go, Joey, um, definitely let us know. But um, I, I think, um, you know, I, I kind of gave the overview. And the thing with patents like this is is Spotify, I'm sure will say, and in fact, they gave a statement to Pitchfork when this first came out, where they were like, oh, well, we file patents for all kinds of things, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're planning to use this. Um, but ironically, yesterday, the same day that we launched our campaign, they started rolling out an Alexa like, you know, hey, Spotify feature to use ha have like a keyword for voice activation so that you can be, you know, from across the room, say, hey, Spotify, you know, play whatever for me, play downtown voice for me. Um, and, um, you know, and so that I think just does indicate that like they are continuing to push in this direction and they're maximizing for growth, like it, which is sort of, you know, the ethos in Silicon Valley to a certain extent. Um, and and so I again, I, you know, I, I can go back to the patent in a second, but I think just to head off kind of like what I'm, I'm guessing they will say um, is like they clearly are heading in this direction. And, and also they're already basically doing this right. They're already conducting a form of emotional surveillance in the sense that they are like bringing in this enormous amount of data about you, your age, your demographics. Um, and, uh, and then also what you listen to and when you listen to it. Um, and they can actually infer quite a bit of information from that about your daily habits, about your mood. Um, and then they use that to recommend music and ads, right? And so they're already sort of doing this. And then the patent is basically to layer on top of that, basically just one more input of data, which would be literally your conversations. So that they would catch snippets of conversations and then run this AI voice analysis on it um, and that might trigger things like this person is angry, this person is having an argument, this person is sad. You could also imagine them using it to have certain keywords that they're listening for to infer your political orientation and then use that to serve you ads um, or even recommend music. Um, so there's really, you know, like the, the patent was specifically to do this kind of music recommendation through conversation monitoring. But once they have that data, you know, we sort of know that like, there's no end of like what they could do with it. And just given their behavior, we sort of, we can sort of infer what they would do with it, which is they would continue using it to like, get better and better and better at like, giving you the music that they think you want to hear that keeps you listening and keeps you on the platform, right? Um, and again, it's like, it's when we think about what, it, what does that actually then do? I think, again, you can look at other surveillance capitalist giants like Facebook or YouTube, where what we see is it's like, I think the idea that like those platforms like amplify like far right content because they are, you know, like ideologically aligned is actually wrong. They amplify that kind of content because it's really engaging and it generates advertising revenue for them. And so it's interesting to think about how that plays out with Spotify, where it's like the algorithm will just sort of decide what to amplify, not because it like likes the music or because, you know, in some cases it'll be like Joey said, like, cause they're literally getting paid to amplify certain stuff it, through their deals with major labels. But then beyond that, like the algorithm will just favor certain types of music or certain 
things that it likes because it knows that it kind of like generates advertising revenue um, or gen or keeps people on the platform. Um, and the ways that that could kind of distort music, I, again, I just think are like, it just creeps me out and, and like bums me out. Um, cause I care, you know, cause like music is so awesome. <laughs> um, and I, I think we can like forget that a little bit in this too. Like we're not just talking about like wages in the end, like that's so important, but we're also just talking about like the, this art form and the ways that like corporations could like fucking ruin it for us. <laughs> um, am I allowed to curse on the fight for the future live stream, Joe? I don't yeah, know. Totally. All right, good. <laughs> so, you know, <clears throat> they're undoubtedly already doing some form of algorithmic manipulation with the content on their platform. And, and, and this is a, a question for you, Joey, but I, I'm sure you, you also, Evan, have um, a take on this as well. But do you find that um, your music on the platform behaves differently or the, the, the audience attention um, is any different than other platforms that, you're, that your music is on versus Spotify? Um, like, does Spotify seem to favor a certain part of your catalog um, or like, like, does it, does it like manipulate things in a way that you find notably different than other platforms? And is, does that, is that like a, like a source of frustration or, or, or like, you know, what, what is your, what is your experience with Spotify um, versus other platforms in terms of like algorithmic manipulation and amplification? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and on some level, the, the answer is, um, I don't know. And, and nobody really knows. And that's one of the problems is that so much of this is mysterious and behind closed doors. Um, they're, they're clearly manipulating it, right? We, we know that you can look at the data and we know that a, a smaller and smaller number of people are making money in this industry. Um, we know in terms of who's listening to what that, again, it's, it's going to a smaller and smaller number um, of, of artists, all m wide majority of whom are on a, you know, one of these three top record labels that kind of controls everything in the music industry. Um, I mean, I know we know Spotify has moved the industry toward, for instance, uh, playlisting toward people are only listening to like one of your songs that may fit in with like, yeah. A particular emotional state um and you know as i saying they've been doing this for a while right liz pelly has written in the baffler uh, an article called big mood machine um how spotify is already pursuing this kind of emotional surveillance and um you know seeking to intensify it but it, it you know we've gotten kind of used to this this playlisting model um but as everyone's saying it really disrupts how we listen to music um and how we conceive of this art form because then you go to sites like Bandcamp you know, that sells, uh, allows artists to sell their records and it's still as a record, you know, you can, you can have people listen to and, 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 you know, appreciate your music in the way that you intend it to. Um, whereas with Spotify, right, it's an algorithm or some faceless curator deciding, um, how this is going to end up. Um, and in, in response to Spotify often says things like, you know, we're, um, we're, we're disrupting the music industry for good because in the past you had all these gatekeepers like these journalists and radio DJs who decided what you listen to and um, we're coming in disrupting all that and it's just the fans get what they want to hear and that's kind of one of their biggest talking points um, and as we're discussing it it's, it's really one of the most dangerous uh, tech talking points um, particularly for music is the idea that it's like just people getting what they want it's like no it's you're getting what Spotify is giving you to, uh, to make the most money. You're getting who, whatever combination of a faceless curator um, and an algorithm's deciding is on these top five Spotify playlists that determine so much of who, of uh, which artist gets listened to. Um, you know, they're very much guiding this, whether it's by profit motive, connections to major labels, um, you know, a small number of secretive curators, whoever it is. But yeah, the, this, this idea that, uh, yeah, the fans are just choosing who, and who's, who are the winners and losers in Spotify is absolutely absurd. And that's just what they keep repeating. But, you know, as we see with this new patent they're trying to take out, uh, it's, it's very much not you just uh, getting what you want here. Yeah, totally. It's like, and again, it's so frustrating because it's like, yeah, like Bandcamp, like you can stream music on Bandcamp too, right? And like people, like there's nothing inherently wrong with like, 
people being able to just like go online and listen to music. Um, it's, but like the, it's so much more than that. And also that, yeah, that talking point too, is like so funny because it's like, well, we're just trading gatekeepers for other gatekeepers in, in a big way. Right. And then also like if they actually were transparent and like would let us see under the hood, it would very quickly become obvious just like how bullshit all of that is. And so I, I, I think it's awesome that y'all have been hammering on the transparency point um, specifically, because again, it's like in a way, the secrecy, it, it, the secrecy of the algorithm, the secrecy of their, their agreements with labels um, is what conceals kind of, or is like, you know, that the emperor has no clothes or whatever um, in the end. But um, what, Joey, what's like next for Yuma? Um, you know, obviously we've got this um, surveillance campaign and, you know, our friends at Access Now, who are like an international human human rights and digital rights organization have sent Spotify a letter and I expect we'll get some kind of response. So we'll figure out what next steps are there. We've got maybe 5,000 signatures on the stop Spotify surveillance.org petition already. Um, so definitely head over there and we can drop that in the comments um, if folks want. But um, but yeah, do you all, what do you all have planned next um, around the Justice at Spotify effort or and how can people kind of get involved or, or help out whether they're artists or not um, in supporting the work that you all are doing? Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah, we have a lot of exciting things coming up. Um, so people can get involved by going to uh, unionofmusicians.org and you can put your email into that um, to, to join UMA and to also sign on to the Justice at Spotify campaign to uh, sign on to our demands if you're a music worker. Um, and we'll have some new member meetings coming up soon to you can get involved in, you know, whatever part of the music industry you care about. Or if you have a new part of the music industry you care about or you want to start a local in your city come get involved, you know, building this out very actively. Um, and we need as many people as involved as possible to get this moving. Um, as for just at Spotify, we're working on a number of fronts, you know, we're speaking with um, legislators right now to talk about, um, you know, potential legal solutions on this or to continue using, um, you know, to use politics, politics and politicians to pressure the company. Um, over the past year, for instance, the, U the UK has been running a parliamentary inquiry into streaming um, to put these companies and the record companies, you know, feet to the fire to answer questions about these issues around transparency and payments. Um, they're still in that process right now. It'd be wonderful to see something similar to that happen in the U.S. So we're looking at these kind of legislative solutions because we need, you know, better regulations against these things like surveillance technologies, against things like payola, against how these payment systems are operating. You know, so we're looking at that. And we're also, you know, excited about these like long term more may perhaps utopian solutions. You know, there's a lot of exciting projects going on like streaming co-ops, like um, ideas about creating nationalized streaming libraries. There's already a lot of uh, local libraries around the US who have, um, you know, local libraries that make sure that artists are getting paid and that run kind of local streaming services. Um, so there's a lot of um, exciting work being done, you know, directly targeting this campaign on a labor level um, to put pressure on them these legislative angle and then these kind of alternative models. Um, and there's, you know, the work you all are doing that we're joining into as well. So there's a lot of exciting stuff happened and it all depends on us, you know, joining together and building this power. So definitely go to the website, unimusicians.org and, and get involved. Cool. So um, quick question for you, Evan, and I think we touched on this a little bit, but I think we can probably go a little bit deeper, but like, how would you say what's going on with Spotify and and the way that they are analyzing user data? How do, how how would you say that fits into like the broader context of um, surveillance capitalism that we see from companies like YouTube and Facebook and and Google and things like that? Cool. And bye, Joey. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I I touched on this a little bit before, but um, I think. Um, Again, it's it's really important to differentiate. I, I feel like Facebook has almost done a good job at like tricking us into thinking that like Facebook is the internet, and it like hurts my heart when I hear people say things like I was saying before, where people are like, you know, the internet is bad for music, or like the internet is bad for democracy, when in fact, like I actually think that like the internet, as in you know this network of people being able to communicate with each other and this potential for creating essentially a universal library of human knowledge and creativity and having it be accessible um, to everyone 
is like the one of the most like powerful and transformative um revolutionary technologies of of ever um and and has this potential to like democratize our society and our economy in in really profoundly good ways and we've seen a lot of that um and and yet we're really now starting to see as a, a again a very small handful of companies have risen to power um the ways that there is that this business model of surveillance capitalism, meaning um, a business model that's based on harvesting our data and using it to uh, manipulate us, essentially to manipulate us to buy things, to manipulate us to consume certain types of content, to manipulate uh, how we consume content, whether it's video or uh, photos or reading, etc. Um, and to do that in this never ending pursuit for advertising dollars, right? And that everything that these platforms do is about maximizing engagement, which basically means clicking on things and looking at things so that they can raise money for advertisers, um, or at least make advertisers spend money on them. They don't actually care whether the advertisers, the advertising works, um, which is another kind of funny thing about all of this. And I think that's probably interesting for Spotify too. Like, I wonder. You know how much all of the they they do all of this emotional surveillance, and I'm sure it's probably pretty good at recommending music. But I wonder how good it actually is at like selling things, um, and and how much of it is actually kind of a bubble, um, which I think is interesting as well. Because again, they're 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 they might end up like forever ruining um, like the way that we consume music, and then like not even survive, um, or uh, you know, kind of like affect a lot of people's livelihoods and careers all at the same time, because what they're selling is actually kind of bullshit. Um, but yeah, broadly, I think it's important that we think about how these are connected, because in the end, a lot of the solutions are the same, right? Um, we need to, you know, we need to stop thinking that there's one like magical silver bullet solution that like fixes big tech and surveillance capitalism and like leaves us in that, um, you know, utopian uh, uh, vegetable garden or whatever that we want the internet to be. Um, and, and, you know, and we've seen that in Congress where, you know, lawmakers are like going back and forth endlessly on Section 230, which they barely understand, um, or just sort of like beating up on big tech companies without actually doing anything about it. Um, but, you know, we need to get into recognizing that there's like a bunch of tools that are like right there. The first one I would say is strong federal data privacy legislation. You know, if we had a law that first and foremost, doesn't just, you know, make companies ask your permission to harvest certain types of data, but actually says, no, you cannot harvest enormous amounts of data that you do not need to provide your service. Um, you know, we could outright ban that type of surveillance advertising. Um, and in fact, you know, we their lawmakers have started talking about doing just that. Anna Eshoo mentioned at a hearing a couple of weeks ago that she was looking at introducing legislation that would ban micro-targeted advertising entirely. Um, stuff like that would, you know, do way more to actually address the types of harms that we're seeing from big tech platforms like Facebook and YouTube um, than, you know, anything we could do with Section 230 or kind of this endless back and forth demanding that they moderate more or moderate less. Um, you know, targeting the root of the problem being the data um, would actually do a lot of good. Uh, I think antitrust is another area where, you know, we're seeing some real bipartisan momentum targeted toward Facebook and Google and Apple. Um, but we're getting to the point where Spotify might, you know, like certainly some of their business practices can and should be viewed as anti-competitive. Um, you know, they enter into these secret deals with large record labels. Um, and, you know, it is very hard to create an, a, a competitor to Spotify right now. And I would also argue that part of that is because of the way our copyright system works, right? And, you know, copyright maximalism has led to a scenario where in order to create a streaming service like Spotify, where people can stream, you know, most music, um, you have to have an inordinate amount of capital up front to enter into those royalties agreements. Um, so that people can stream the Beatles or whatever, right? Um, whereas like Bandcamp, you know, doesn't have that same model. Um, they allow artists to sell their music. And so, you know, you can find all kinds of like cool independent artists on Bandcamp, but people don't go there when they want to, you know, like put on 
like, you know, background music for their mom or something like that. And so that I think is part of the problem as well, is that their business practices are sort of anti-competitive and our current broken copyright system sort of reinforces their monopoly by creating such a high barrier of entry for anyone to compete with them. Um, so I think reform to uh, copyright policy to, um, you know, rethink the way that some of this is done would be another way um, to kind of address some of this harm from big tech. Um, and then finally, I would say, um, you know, we need to create alternatives, right? I saw somebody in the chat in the YouTube mention um, something about Bitcoin, and it seemed like you, they were asking maybe if there was some, like if Spotify had a specific scheme around creating its own cryptocurrency or something like that. I haven't heard anything about that, but I do think it's it's interesting to think about. And Joe, I know you, you know you could probably speak to this quite a bit more than me. You know, I mean, there's lots of issues to work out around um, you know some of the environmental impacts and stuff like that. But as we think about decentralizing the internet more and more, it does seem like something like Spotify is like the perfect example of something that should be a decentralized protocol where any artist can upload, you know, put their music into a place and get paid for it every time people listen to it. And that could be done with microtransactions or something else. And you don't need some centralized gatekeeper like Spotify. And you know, people could build all kinds of apps on top of that where you know you can where they do curate music or um, and you can like look for those and find ones that you like. But generally speaking, for artists, it's like we own and control the means of production for our own. Um, labor, uh, artistic creations. Um, so I think like, you know, again, I don't, I don't think, I think anyone who comes along and tells you like, yep, we've got that perfectly figured out and it's going to be NFTs or it's going to be this, or it's going to be that is like probably getting ahead of themselves. But I think at least looking in that direction of creating more decentralized, more community-based, um, alternatives and some of the stuff that Joey was talking about, um, should be, or could be the future of streaming and the future of, um, you know, music um, in, in ways that would be way more liberatory and awesome than anything that we'll get out of this surveillance capitalist model from companies like Spotify and YouTube. Yeah, what I see as the decentralized alternative to that would be a service that um, it, it would be a decentralized autonomous organization um, that would allow you know our artists to upload their work to some sort of decentralized file file sharing service like interplanetary file system ipfs um that could handle the the hosting and then um the music could be distributed in 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 a like a basically a protocol that you could build any app on top of so you don't need to rely on one specific group or project to get access to that information and when the user listens to the song, um, it would it would basically enter them into some sort of a smart contract agreement where you send them a microtransaction that would be the equivalent of a cent or maybe even more, um, depending on how you want to uh, distribute you know your money. And then what ends up happening is the artist makes more and the user would be spending less than they would on a Spotify subscription. And at least philosophically speaking, spending less on, 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 you know, giving them their, their user data, it would be anonymous. And, and it would be, I think a lot, I, I think everyone wins there. And when it what's when, when it's with something like Spotify, really only Spotify wins. So I do think that, that decentralized alternatives are, are a really good solution to the problem. However, uh, obviously, nothing like that exists currently, but I think that we could see something like that uh, in, the, in the near future. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, cool. I don't know. I mean, we could go for a few more minutes. We could wrap up. We could finish out with like playing the video if we want, um, and I can like give people a little bit more about the campaign. Um, do you want to? So we'll do. I, I was thinking we could do this. I could uh, share share the site with everybody and give everybody a look at it over the stream, um, and we can talk about the site a little, and then we can close out with the video. How does that sound? Yeah, it sounds good. Cool. All right. So let me put that up on the screen. Cool. And while Joe's getting it up, I'll just explain um, to folks who are watching what we're talking about. So when we released this campaign yesterday, we released it in conjunction with a, a video for a song from um, I, and my album that's actually out today. It's called Spotify Surveillance. Um, and the song is about surveillance capitalism. And so we decided to basically use the video, which was designed by super amazing video designer Michael Flowers. 
um, as a way to kind of kickstart this campaign and help raise awareness about it. So we launched um, StopSpotifySurveillance.org, which Joe has up now. It's basically a simple petition to Spotify. You can fill out the form, send them a message. Um, and uh, we've already got about 5,000 people who've signed on so far. You can also check a box if you're an artist that has music on Spotify so we can uh, you know, kind of communicate to them that not only is this something that music listeners don't want, but artists don't want it either. Artists are not interested in um, for subjecting music listeners to this type of emotional surveillance and audio surveillance. Um, and then, yeah, we just explain a little bit about um, you know, kind of what some of the concerns are. Um, we link to, um, again, that letter from our friends at Access Now um, that they sent to Spotify that, you know, kind of get specific about what some of the potential harms of this type of um, surveillance and audio uh, uh, analysis is. You know, one of the things they speak to specifically that, you know, I should just highlight is um, the way that the idea that Spotify could use your voice to infer your gender um, is obviously just sort of fundamentally flawed. Um, it ignores trans folks like myself. Um, my voice doesn't necessarily um, uh, map with uh, my gender presentation and certainly not with my music preferences. Um, and so I think it's um, really, you know, there's just, they, they get to kind of some of the different types of harms. And I think another one that they talk about is just security, that forget about privacy or, you know, justice or equality or any of those things. Just the fact that we're creating, we're normalizing this practice of having um, more and more applications on our phones, on our computers that are constantly listening to us and watching us um, is, you know, creates this enormous attack surface, not just for, uh, you know, kind of what we think of as traditionally bad actors like hackers or stalkers or whatever, um, but for law enforcement or the government potentially. Um, I can absolutely imagine a scenario where, uh, you know, the FBI or local law enforcement go to Spotify and say, hey, we believe a crime was committed in this house. Um, we want you to hand over all of the audio that you collected um, from that user during this time period. And we want you to hand over any of the metadata that you collected in, in case you analyze that audio and could tell us whether there was an argument or whether someone was talking about politics or uh, et cetera and so forth. So it's really important that we remember once data is collected, um, it, it, it is a feature and not a bug that that data can and will be repurposed and abused for a wide variety of purposes. Um, and so the video definitely gets into that as well. Um, but yeah, anything you want to say before we wrap, Joe, and, and play it for folks? No, I think that, that about covers it. So um, before uh, we close out, I just want to say, um, first of all, thank you very much for joining uh, me today, Evan. It was a really interesting conversation. Um, so I appreciate sure. that. And um, yeah, if you like content like this, if you like this, uh, th these live streams, please make sure you subscribe to us um, on YouTube, um, click the bell for notifications and like this video because like we've been saying it, with the algorithm, it, it certainly helps uh, with suggestions uh, with, within the YouTube uh, algorithm. Um, ironically. Also, <laughs> yeah, ironically. We're also on um, iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts, um, and we're also on Spotify. So if you want to listen to the audio-only version or if you ever miss an episode, it'll be there. And we also have a playlist on the account so that you can uh, access these episodes, uh, that, you know, previous episodes that we've had in the past. Um, yeah. I'm going to hop back over onto that page and we can close out with, uh, with, with your new video, Evan. Cool. Thanks. And yeah, I'll just quickly say, you know, it's like funny, like, cause we're now shouting out, like we're going to put, you know, this is going to be on Spotify. And I think it's actually important though, because like this, none of this is about like shaming you if you listen to Spotify or like shaming artists for having their music on Spotify or shaming you for using Facebook or YouTube or whatever. These are collective problems that require a collective response. So this isn't about your individual use of these platforms. This is about fighting for policies that protect people and fighting for alternatives um, so that we have alternatives to these platforms. Um, but in the meantime, we have to use the tools available to us to get the word out. Um, so that's what we're doing here. And now, Surveillance Capitalism, the music video. <laughs> we live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable. So did the divine right of the king.
once consent was manufactured Now it's harvested for clicks Algorithms make decisions Filter bubbles make us sick We're all connected to machines Paid every second but we just can't look away We all want to be seen but behind the screen There's a nightmare dressed up as a dream And we can't wake up Private companies basically have more power and more information on us than governments do without any sort of infrastructure to hold them accountable Every thought Charted, processed, optimized Senator, we run out Eye movements, facial expressions Manipulation, monetized We're all connected to machines Paid every second, but we just can't look away We all want to be seen, but behind the screen There's a nightmare dressed up as a dream And we can't wake up There's a difference between knowing something and doing something about it We assume that there should be a prison system There should be a surveillance apparatus I think that these assumptions need to be questioned An infinite playground, a library Human creativity They paved it over, put up walls Now it's billboards, big box, shopping malls Paid every second, but we just can't look away We all want to be seen, but behind the screen There's a nightmare dressed up as a dream And we can't wake up Neither math nor machines can extract four centuries of white And we can't wake up Neither math nor machines can extract four centuries of white supremacy from American policing. Simply inserting digital technologies into discriminatory policing without addressing its fundamental flaws can only serve to supersize that discrimination, can only serve to reduce community safety, and can only violate the civil rights of the most vulnerable among us. Nothing else can happen. Cool. That's that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Evan. And uh, we'll see everybody next week. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Bye.